Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now, put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your Creator. In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, this is your word. And as such, it is meant for our upbuilding, our edification. And it is also meant for our reproof and correction. Your word sheds light on our lives and reveals to us those places which are out of accord with the image of God, out of accord with your will for our lives. And as we come to this word, cause us to come with our hearts in such a posture that we are ready to be changed and corrected by it. This means, Lord God, that we must come not judging this word, but being judged by this word. But how sweet it is to be sought out and judged by you and so corrected and sent down the way of life. So by your spirit, make this book a blessing and make us all both hearers and doers of the word. And we will give you the praise and the glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've ever renovated an older home, some of you, I know, have done that. Some of the worst news that you can hear from your contractor is that all the wiring is faulty and needs to be replaced, stripped out. That's really bad news to hear. Of course, if you don't do it, you're risking disaster. Well, you might consider Paul's project in the letter to the Colossians to be stripping out the faulty wiring of false teaching. There were false teachers causing trouble to the church in Colossae, and he's been stripping out the faulty wiring, and he's been laying new wiring of sound doctrine and faithful teaching. Now, as often happens in a house with bad wiring, your appliances will blow you. And the Colossians, Paul says, the tools that they were deploying to try to live out their faith, like appliances in a house with faulty wiring that keep blowing out. He says in chapter 2, verse 23, these things you're using are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. It just doesn't work. The Christian lives were malfunctioning. And then here in chapter 3, he wants to give us new tools that will work at last to help us grow in Christian obedience. And the heart of Paul's message is that a Christian is someone who has been united to Jesus Christ. So at the end of chapter 2, verse 20, he says, you died with Christ. And then in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, you were raised with Christ. And now he says, since that's true, since when you became a Christian, you passed from death to life in union with Jesus, here's how I want you to live. And in our passage, verses 5 through 11, he offers some negative counsel. He's going to show us how to deal with the problem of indwelling sin. And then, Lord willing, as we'll see next week, he begins to offer positive counsel. Here's how to grow in the Christian life. So first of all, here in our passage, he's answering the question, how do we deal with our sin problem? How do you deal with what is earthly in you? Your sin, your remaining corruption as a Christian. And we're going to consider his answer under two headings. In verses 5 through 7, Paul says, Dealing with sin is like an execution. You have to put it to death. It's like an execution. And then verses 8 through 11, Dealing with sin is like changing clothes, taking off the filthy rags of your old life, and dressing in a way that is consistent with your new identity 
in Jesus Christ. So dealing with sin first is like an execution, and dealing with sin secondly is like a change of clothes. That's where we're going. And the big idea we need to believe is this. Christ is your new life, so leave your old life behind and follow him. That's the main point of Paul's teaching here. So first, dealing with sin is like an execution. Look with me at verse 5 through 7. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. So what is Paul telling us to do? He's telling us to go to war, friends. The scripture is calling on you to become a stone-cold killer of sin. Nothing less. You could picture a contract assassin hunting down the prey, getting that one in the crosshairs and pulling the trigger until the person they're seeking is dead. Now you think, that's not Christian. Well, and when it comes to another human being, absolutely not. But when it comes to your sin, that's exactly what you're called to do. Show it no mercy. We must put it to death. John Owen said it very simply. Be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. He does not say, manage it. No, you've got to kill it. It will take time. It will be painful. Your sin will be slow and reluctant. You must drag it into the light, confess it, own it, turn from it, and kill it. Don't say to yourself, I've got it under control. Everything in moderation, after all, as long as I'm not hurting anyone. Brothers and sisters, don't manage your sin. Managing sin is another name for disobedience. Disobedience justified is sin managed. Kill sin. Richard Baxter, another Puritan, put it this way. Deal with sin as it would deal with you. Spare it not, for it will not spare you. It is your murderer and the murderer of the world. Deal with it, therefore, as a murderer should be dealt with. Kill it before it kills you. And though it bring you to the grave, as it did Christ your head, it shall not be able to keep you there forever. Amen. Grace wins. Resurrection wins. We're going to be free someday. But that someday isn't here yet. And so we're called on to fight, to put sin to death. And this, Paul argues, is the result of being heavenly minded. Right? He's just set forth in verses 1 through 4 the heavenly mindset we must deploy. And then he says in verse 5, Therefore, here are the earthly members we must destroy. Right? Because Christ is your life, put sin to death. Because someday he's going to appear and judge the world, put sin to death. Because someday you will appear with him in glory, and sin will not be there anymore. Right? God has deemed it unworthy of his eternal state, so it is to be destroyed now as much as you can. Therefore, because of all these things, put sin to death. As the hymn says, I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. You know, there's a ruthlessness we're often missing in the Christian life. See if you recognize this in your own heart. We hear God's word, and our conscience immediately stings with recognition. We see the sinfulness of our sin, don't we? And we know we ought to act. But then another voice begins to speak, trying to drown out the voice of conscience. Please, let me live, says your pornography addiction. Please, don't kill me, says your judgmentalism. I'll tell you what, says your festering resentment. If you just let me live, you can turn over a new leaf. You can be more patient with your children. Speak more kindly to your spouse. Listen, you can read your Bible every day. Or go to church every Sunday. Never miss a service. When the doors are open, we'll make sure you're there. Just let me live. In fact, I think you might be getting a little carried away with all this kill your sin stuff. Everything in moderation, after all. Well, Paul says, no. You need to deal with sin like an executioner, without mercy. 
killing your much-loved sin. And notice Paul says, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. We're not called to assassinate the sins of others. Our own sin is the target. Thomas Brooks wrote, A sincere Christian hates all sinful ways, but his own first and most. So we need to look in the mirror and admit, I need to face up to the reality of my ongoing sin. I have been delivered from sin's reign, but have not yet been freed from the presence of sin. A constant war ensues within me as my earthly nature wages war against my soul. And so I need to look sin in the eye, personally, and particularly. Robert Murray McChain wrote in his journal, I have begun to realize that the seeds of every known sin still linger in my heart. Friends, this is evidence of grace. Knowing this means that your eyes have been opened to see the truth about your remaining sin. And so Paul turns now to name the battlefields. He gives two different lists of sins in verse 5 and verse 8. Sins of perverted love and sins of perverted hate. But the first list just has to do with the fact that our hearts were built to love, to yearn, to desire. And that's good. But this is perverted love, out of bounds love. You're acting in ways that it's not love. These are perversions of the good, God-given desire for sexual intimacy. Now, sexual sins can be some of the most difficult transgressions to resist, as sex-crazed as our society is. And there's a lesson in a list, isn't there? We need to call sin what it is. Call a spade a spade. Call it sexual immorality, not I'm fooling around a little. Impurity, not I'm struggling with my thought life. Evil desire, not this is my natural orientation. Greed, which is idolatry, not I need to order my priorities a bit better. We need to agree with God that these are, in fact, sins against the Lord. You know, the world celebrates sins of perverted love. Their argument is love is love. But friends, you won't find good arguments for things the Bible condemns. Bad arguments only convince those wishing to justify their sin. And so Paul starts with the physical, outward expression of sin, and then he begins to peel the layers back. What's behind all of this? Down deep into the motives of our hearts. You see, sin is more than just a surface behavior issue. Sin adheres to the very roots of our humanity, all the way down into the roots of how you think, what you prefer, warping and distorting and biasing us against the Lord and against his law. And so he starts with sexual immorality. The word in Greek here is porneia, from which we get, of course, the word pornography. And it refers to illicit sexual sins. The word covers all forms of prostitution, every illegitimate sexual deviance, both heterosexual, homosexual, or even bestial. And true holiness demands total sexual purity. The proper channel of sexual expression is between one man and one woman in the covenant of marriage. But sin has distorted what God intended to be a beautiful thing. You see, sex is like a fire. In a fireplace, it's a great thing. It provides warmth, comfort, light. But outside of that proper context, it's destructive and will consume you. But sin doesn't start with the actions of porneia. He links with it the attitude of the heart, impurity. Right? It's uncleanness, evil thoughts and intentions of a defiled mind, dirty patterns of thinking and speaking, desensitizing us to the filth, a corruption of your conscience by repeated immoral living. You get the picture maybe of a, a dirty pipe, clean water running through it, and it's fouled up by the end. So what's he trying to get into is our heads. He's trying to get into our thought life. He means for us to consider that what the mind will linger on in secret, the body will eventually do externally. So don't just kill sin in your deeds and your actions. You do it in your thought life as well. And then a step back from that is lust or passion, a sense of heat, of emotions getting stirred up that come 
and master us, uncontrolled and uncontrollable. Hosea 7, verse 4 and following says, All of them commit adultery. They are like an oven heated by a baker who stops stirring the fire from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. For they, their hearts, like an oven, draw him into their oven. Their anger smolders all night. In the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. It's heat. It's passion. It's tragic when you hear a man say, after committing adultery with the secretary, I don't know what happened. It just took over like a freight train. What a fool. What did you think would happen? Can a man embrace fire and his clothes not be burned? But that's lust. An inflamed, inordinate emotion that's been allowed to burst its banks. It's over-desire. And then there's evil desire. So not just over-desire, but desire for what's wicked or wrong. God created us to yearn to want things. But this is perverse desire. Wanting something you ought not to want. It's a good gift to want. It's bad to apply it to evil things. That evil desire applies it to. If you desire something good, that desire itself is good. But if you desire something evil, then the desire itself is evil. To want to sin is itself sinful. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 27, You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Clearly, committing adultery with someone else's spouse is wrong. And so, the desire to commit that deed is also wrong. That's why Jesus prohibits even the desire to commit adultery. You see, our desires and our attractions tend towards certain ends. If we want to understand our own desires, we have to know what ends our desires and attractions are aimed at. The only sex desire that glorifies God is that desire that is ordered to the covenant of marriage. And when sexual desire or attraction fixes on any kind of non-marital activity, it falls short of the glory of God and is, by definition, sinful. And this principle applies to every one of our desires, including opposite sex and same-sex desire. Now, the key difference is that opposite sex desire may have the covenant of marriage as its end and therefore be good. Or it may not, and therefore be evil. But same-sex desire can never have the covenant of biblical marriage as its end, and therefore is always an evil desire. So Paul's saying, if your desires are not changed, then your thought life is going to revert to what it was doing before, and your behavior is going to revert to what it was doing before. You know that when you sin, if you secretly harbor the desire to continue that sin, you will, in fact, at some point, give in to the deed. But if you nip the desire for the sin in the bud, then you can get it in the behavior. Then you can get it in the thought life. So Paul's saying, I want your deeds, your thinking, and your desires to be freed of sin. I want you to attack sin at the root. I want you to kill the sin in you. And he ends the list by suggesting that all sexual deviance is a form of greed or covetousness, which is a form of idolatry. These sins are selfish at their heart. John Calvin said, Man's mind is a perpetual factory of idols. You have lost your mind when you think that life is about satisfying what brings pleasure to you and you alone. You have made yourself like God when you think that way. You are bowing down to the God of self. Idolatry is taking the created thing and putting it above your creator. It's saying, I want that more than I want God. And everything terminates on me. And I come to believe this thing, this experience, this feeling, this person even, this indulgence, this is the one thing I must have in order to be free, in order to be happy, in order to be satisfied, in order to be truly me. And so we pursue it, and we live for it, and we serve it. We've got to have it. And slowly we've made for ourselves an idol, giving it to that person, that experience, or even to ourselves, a devotion that only God rightly deserves. That's what greed is, right? It's not just money. It's anything, even in the area of sexual immorality. Remember what Nathan said to David 
This is what the Lord says to you. I gave you all of this. I gave you a kingdom. I gave you everything. If it had been too little, I would have given you more. Why did you want more? Why did you want what wasn't given to you? She was Uriah's wife. She wasn't yours. It's greed. Wanting more. And he put value on her more than on his God. That's the sins of perverted love. So he's given the mandate and a map to the battlefield. But then he gives us a, a motivation. Paul gives two reasons for the license to kill our sin. One future and one past. The future is that there's a coming wrath of God. Look at verse 6. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. If you're wondering if we really need to be that serious about our sin problem, see how seriously God takes it. One day God is coming in Jesus Christ to judge the world in righteousness for its sin and rebellion. God takes sin very, very seriously. And so should we. Put these sins to death. It will destroy you if you don't. Turn or burn, blunt and harsh as that may sound. So friends, I plead with you to see your sin for what it really is in God's sight. My sin leads to not lasting pleasure, but holy, divine displeasure. See the true nature of your sin and the light of its due punishment. Take a heavenly-minded view of sin and know the weight of the judgment it deserves. What's at stake? The wrath of God. It's a terrifying warning. Wrath is God's holy and righteous reaction to sin. And God's wrath is reasonable. You remember Sodom and Gomorrah, known for all their sexual deviance. Fire and brimstone came down and destroyed the whole city. There's the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, another picture of God's wrath. And the greatest of all in the Old Testament was the flood of Noah's day. Every living thing that breathed air in its nostrils died, except those eight persons that were in the ark. But none of those compare to the final expression of God's wrath, which is eternity in hell. Revelation 14, 10 through 11. He will also drink the wine of God's wrath, which is poured full strength into the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. There is no rest day or night. Well, God's wrath is real, friends. And there is only one refuge from the coming wrath. And that is the blood of Jesus Christ. He is our lightning rod. He drank the cup of God's wrath. And if we stand under his shadow, we will be protected from the wrath of God. Have you trusted in him? Have you come to Christ? Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10, Jesus rescues us from the coming wrath. Do you still need to be rescued from it? Or even Christians, he's talking to Christians there, need to be continually rescued by Jesus, continually protected and kept in the faith from indwelling sin until the last day. He rescues us from the coming wrath. Thanks be to God. But he doesn't leave it there, thankfully. He goes on with a past reason. Look at verse 7. He says, And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. He wants us to destroy earthly remnants in us because they're part of the former life we once lived. Sin shouldn't be a friend to us anymore. It shouldn't come and spend time in our house. Right now, it's an enemy that we ought to chase off of our property with a weapon of some sort. Sinclair Ferguson writes, The reminder of what we have become by grace is a constant defense against slipping back into what we were by nature. This really is so important if we're not to get crushed down with discouragement. How tempting it is in our daily struggle, in our own heart, in our own sin, to become discouraged and really want to give up. But Paul says, you once walked in these things when you were living in them. Now, do you notice the apparent tension in verse 5 and verse 7? Verse 7, you once walked in these things. You once lived in them. Verse 5, Kill sin right now. Verse 5 assumes sin is a present trouble, a present reality afflicting us. 
Verse 7 says sin is in the past tense. How do you reconcile those two things? Well, actually, reconciling them gives us enormous encouragement to stay in the fight. When you became a Christian, when you passed from death to life, when you were united to Jesus and his death and resurrection, the mastery of sin was broken once and for all. Christians no longer walk in sin. They are no longer living in sin. Yes, you fall into sin. Yes, the remnants of your old life still trouble you. But sin is not in charge anymore. You are no longer its slave. You can kill sin. You can put it to death. You can make progress. So don't give up. Don't back off. Don't sign a truce with your sin. You can and you must kill sin. Or sin will be killing you. Well, how do we do it, though? Well, the scriptures give us a battle plan for killing sin. And I just want to set forth a helpful acronym I learned from Stuart Scott, biblical counselor, one of my teachers. Be prepared by abiding in Christ. First, pray. Praise God. Thank Him for His commands and His gracious blessings. And submit your will to His and seek to please Him. Then rehearse gospel truths. Rehearse what Jesus did in his life, death, and resurrection for me. Rehearse what repentance and faith mean in my life. Rehearse who I am as a new man in Christ. Galatians 5.24 Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And rehearse how I should live as his adopted child. That faith is the life-dominating conviction and practice that all that God has for me through obedience to his revealed word is better by far than anything Satan can offer me through selfishness and sin. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, this is the first step. Come to Christ. You have no business fighting your sin if you're not a Christian. You know why? You can't put sin to death because sin's already put you to death. You're dead spiritually, dead in your transgressions and sins in which you now live. And so you can't fight it. You're already killed. And only Jesus can give you life. Come to Christ. Look to him, dead on the cross, his blood shed for you. Look to him, risen, alive, and reigning from the empty tomb. Believe he is my righteousness. He's my only escape from hell. I must have Christ. Look to him, and he will give you life. And I say to you, believer, that Christ's blood shed on the cross has sin-killing power. There is wonder-working power in the blood, in the minds and hearts of believers. Galatians 6, 14, very important verse. But as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross, and I to the world. You come to the cross, and the world's allure and temptations and enticements look to be the filthy things they are. It was those things that put Jesus to death. And so, believer, be cross-centered. Be much in meditation on Christ's death on the cross. And sin will shrivel as the nasty thing that it is. But then evaluate and set my heart to exercise God-given faith for God's glory. Determine to fight this vicious battle every day. Make it your business every day to get up and mortify the deeds of the flesh. John Owen put it this way, There's not a day but sin foils or is foiled, prevails or is prevailed upon, and it will be whilst we live in this world. you got to get up every day and determine to fight this vicious battle. You don't get any days off. Sin's not going to take any days off. The day you think you're taking a day off from sin, sin's winning. It's already deceived you. Resolve to wake up every morning with your mind and heart stayed on Jesus and ready to exercise God-given faith to kill your sin for God's glory. And then put off old and put on Jesus. You must put sin to death. Refuse it. Starve it. Reject it. You cannot kill sin without the pain of the kill. But notice Paul sets in a very important broader context this command, right? The negative task of putting sin to death will not be accomplished in isolation from the positive call of the gospel to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul's going to spell this out in verses 12 through 17. 
right? Sweeping the house clean simply leaves us open to a further invasion of sin. But as sinful desires and habits are not only rejected, but replaced with Christ-like graces and habits and actions, as we are clothed in Christ's character and his graces are held together by love, not only in our private life, but also in the church fellowship, Christ's name and glory are manifested and exalted in and among us. So Christian, be filled with the Spirit and all of his graces. Fill yourselves with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Fill yourself with Christ. And sin will lose its power over you. And then take action. Charge ahead with my thoughts, actions, and decisions. Right? Resolve to fight sin on all fronts. You're not going to put up the white flag over any sin in your life. You're not going to surrender on any front. You're going to fight sin, all sin, everywhere that it's found in you. Then reload with God's word. We need to keep it up. The Christian life is never a ceasefire and never a single shot battle. We must go again and again to God's word because all the resources are there for life and godliness. And enlist a band of brothers or sisters to help you and pray for you. You need to get yourself a band of brothers or a band of sisters who will tell you the truth, who will be honest with you, with whom you can be honest. And you need to take the risk to come clean about what's really going on, to acknowledge your sin and say, I need help. Will you help me? I need accountability. I need people praying with me. I need people praying for me. I need you to talk to me about this. Sin thrives in the shadows, in the dark, Bring it into the light where it will wither and die. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. This is not a prescription for a long, lonely fight with your sin, struggling all on your own. No, these are battle plans for the whole church to fight together in the great combat with our besetting sin. We need each other and we are to tackle it together. And then lastly, depend on the Holy Spirit for help. Rely on the Holy Spirit, not on fleshly means. We saw in Colossians 2 that harsh treatment of the body lacks any value in restraining sensual indulgence. It will not work. And all of the steps in our mortification, all they do is set the stage for the Spirit to kill the sin. He has the power to do it. Get everything ready and the Spirit will put the sin to death when you have done all the things the Lord's commanded you to do. Romans 8.13, if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So the Spirit acts like a weapon. You kill sin by the Holy Spirit by depending on Him prayerfully for help. So dealing with sin is like an execution. And if you thought that's a long first point, the second point will be briefer. But secondly, dealing with sin... It's like changing clothes. Picking up from verse 7, and the life we once lived, Paul says in verse 8, But now, put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your Creator. In Christ, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. So notice, he changes the metaphor from killing sin to a domestic one, to putting off and then putting on. Live this way, he says, since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. He's saying, you were in prison, right? You used to live behind bars. You wore the orange jumpsuit of an inmate. Now, suddenly, you've been set free. Your chains have fallen off. The prison doors have been flung wide open. You're a free citizen under a bright, free sky. Stop wearing the uniform of a prisoner. Dress like a free man. You're not a prisoner in the cell block of sin anymore. You're a free citizen of the heavenly kingdom. And Christ himself is your life. So dress the part. Live like a man or a woman in Christ, bound for glory, because that's who you really are. That's what Paul's saying. And then he gives another list of sins to help us sort out the dirty laundry in our lives. The first list moved from outward behavior toward the heart. This one begins with the heart 
and then moves out towards behavior. But the point is the same. Both the deep motives and the expression in our thinking, acting, and doing all must be tackled and addressed. Now this time the issue isn't sins of perverted love. This time it's sins of perverted hate. The issue is interpersonal conflict, beginning with the seedbed in the human heart and resulting in the way we speak to each other in daily life. It starts with anger, wrath, and malice, deep festering attitudes hidden away inside us, and then they come bubbling to the surface in slander, obscene talk, and in lying to one another. And Paul is telling us behaviors like that have no place in the Christian life. Put them away. And so he begins with anger. That spirit of being opposed in a hostile way to things that God desires for our lives. You know, anger and wrath are not inherently wrong. For our perfectly holy God can be angry and display his wrath. There is a righteous anger that is perfectly proper and accord with the highest reaches of holiness. But that's not what Paul has in mind here. It is exceedingly difficult for us to be angry without sinning. So we must watch the motives of our hearts if we find feelings of anger welling up within ourselves. We're commanded to put them away, like a, aside like a dirty shirt. <laughs> oh, wouldn't it be sweet, right? If, if it was that easy, just take it off, throw it away, you never see it again. But you have to put it off constantly. Right? How many times do you get angry a day? How many of the times you get angry is your central motive, the glory of God, the coming kingdom of Christ. Tears flow down my eyes because God's law is violated. Well, that's not what it is often, is it? Your law has been violated in some way. Someone failed to meet your expectations. You didn't get what you want. That's why you get angry. And anger is to wrath as a nudge is to a shove. Right? It could also be called fury. It's anger that's built up and it bursts out. It refers to those outbursts of passion, that ungodly rage we have for others. You know, we hear of road rage. We hear of the rage of a spouse towards their other spouse. A seething cauldron of rage flying off the handle. That's what is in, my, in view here. How many people do you think are sitting in prison today never having intended to kill the person they killed? They don't know how it got out of hand. They did want to hurt. They didn't want to kill. It just went beyond what they thought. And then malice. People have said that's the worst of the three because it includes an intention, intentionally doing something wicked and cruel to someone else. Malice refers to ill will towards one's neighbor. It's a refusal to forgive and allied to cynicism. A malicious heart says, I will never forgive them for what they did. I cannot forgive them. It's a settled, cold, long-term rage because of sin that's been done to you. And then comes slander, defaming someone's character, character assassination. It would be wonderful to say the church was free from this kind of thing, but it's not. Paul is calling Christians to be different from the world, not to wag their tongues. Right? If you can't think of something good to say about other people's character, then say nothing at all. And then there's filthy language, abusive speech. It refers to those destructive words we use to tear people down. Paul says people who are captured by sin are people who are internally conflicted. They're filled with rage, and that rage pours over in the life of their speech. You want to see a person characterized by ungodliness and by the grip of Satan on them? They are filled with anger. They are bitter inside, and it pours over in their speech, either in their general speech or in their abusive speech to other people. And Paul says to these Colossians, don't you live that way. Because that's not who you are. That's what you were. But that's not who you are now. Be who you are. And put away these sins. But there's one more thing Paul seems eager to say. Sin cannot always be dealt with privately. In verse 9, he urges the Colossians not to lie to one another. He's calling for truthfulness. But also honesty and accountability. Don't pretend, he seems to be saying. If I'm to function in this church fellowship, then I had better stop pretending that I am better than I am. We need to be able to say to each other, I need your help, counsel, wisdom, and loving rebuke. I am struggling to Zion rather than marching to it. But he doesn't just say, don't lie to one another, right? He gives them a basis. 
And it's in that phrase, since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. Because you've been united to Christ, because you've been embraced by the grace of Christ, now you're able to speak in an edifying and God-glorifying way to one another. In other words, he's reminding us of our new position. How important it is for, to rem- for us to remember our identity in Christ. We are no longer in Adam, but in Christ. No longer in the flesh, but in the spirit. No longer dominated by the old creation, but living in the new. We have died with Christ. We have been buried with Christ. We have been raised with Christ, and our life is hidden with Christ. Indeed, so united to Christ are we that Christ will not appear in glory without us. So brothers and sisters, failure to deal with sin can often be traced back to spiritual amnesia, forgetfulness of our new, true, real identity. As a believer, I have been delivered from the dominion of sin and am therefore free and motivated to fight against the remnants of sin's army in my heart. Recognize the inconsistency of your sin. Right? You put off the old man. You put on the new man. New men live new lives. Anything less is a contradiction of who I am in Christ. But note also the progress of the new man. Here's another note of strong encouragement where Paul says, it's not something that happened in the past and is no longer has any effect. No, your renovation in Christ is an ongoing work. It's not finished. There's a lot more work to be done in us. God is at work in you to renew you in knowledge after the image of your creator. It's not just that you are at work, but there is one at work within you to work and to will for his good pleasure. God hasn't left you alone in the struggle, and he will finish what he started. And doesn't that help you? If you're like me, there are times when you find yourself in the dust again, stumbling and falling. How did I get here again? Still doing that, still thinking that. Still feeling that, still saying that. I'm so discouraged and weary because every time I try to make progress, I stumble back and fall again. And we're tempted to just give up, just to sign a truce. And Paul's saying, God will never quit on you. He will finish the work he began in you. You may not see how you'll get there from where you are right now, but his promise is sure. So don't quit because the victory is certain. But notice also the pattern of the new man. What, what is the direction of our salvation? It's the restoration of the God image. Paul says we're being renewed in a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. We saw in Colossians 1 that Christ is the image of the invisible God, the one by whom and for whom everything was created. We are now being conformed to him. In the garden, we had been created in the image of God. By Adam's sin, that image was defaced but not entirely erased. It was distorted, but not completely destroyed. And what God is doing in our salvation is he's recreating us as a new creation, restored to that moral image which he had implanted in us in the first place, now patterned after his beloved son. And that's one reason why a believer ought to care about holiness, because that image of Christ consists in our holiness, in our godliness. One day, brothers and sisters, no matter how often you've stumbled, And following along the way, one day you will shine with the radiance of the perfect moral likeness of Jesus Christ when the work is finished and you see your Savior face to face at last. It is his promise, his guarantee. He is making you new. So don't quit. Don't back off. Since the work in which you are engaged of putting sin to death, of putting sin off, is a work that cannot fail. Not because you are strong, but because of the grace and the promise of God. But notice in verse 11 the partnership of the new man. Paul says it doesn't matter what backgrounds we're from in this congregation. We can be Jews or Greeks. We can be slave or free. We can be barbarians or even Scythians. Our Scythians were the lowest of the low. Even the barbarians talked bad about the Scythians. And they were considered the outcasts. They were the worst people you could possibly imagine. Paul says if there are former Scythians and barbarians in this congregation who are now in Christ... Christ is their Lord and he's indwelling them. He's recreating them in the image of God as surely as he is that converted Jew, as surely as he is that educated Greek. Everyone in this congregation who is in Christ has been restored in the image of Christ. Well, Therefore, we must treat all with impartiality because God is not treating them with partiality. 
If Christ is not ashamed to indwell them, then I will not be slow to embrace them. God is doing the same work in all of us, regardless of our educational level, regardless of our ethnic background, regardless of our national credentials, regardless of any other factor in our background. And therefore, we are to treat one another in such a way as to build each other up and establish unity in the congregation. The fractured fellowship that sin produces is mended. Natural enemies are made one in Jesus Christ. So that color, ethnicity, economics, and education could not matter, letter, matter less to us than that we are one in Jesus Christ. And finally, Paul ends with the preeminent ruler of the new man. Notice that last phrase. But Christ is all and all. What does it mean to live under the rule of Christ? What does it mean to acknowledge the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ in our lives? To live under the rule of Christ means to be made a new person in Christ. And it means to stop our old patterns of living, thinking, and behaving. Those patterns which are not in accord with Christ. Those patterns which were not in accord with the word of God. Those patterns which, in fact, were self-destructive. It means to put those off, to lay them aside, to walk in newness of life, to live in a godly way, to put off and put on. That's what it means to live under the rule of Christ. Augustine said it like this, Christ is not valued at all unless he is valued above all. So here's the heart of the matter. Christ is your new life. So leave your old life behind and follow him. That is what God is calling us to do. You see, Christian, at one time you were an old person in Adam. Now you are new in Christ. And we talk about people seeing everything as black or white. And God sees everything that way, too. He sees the human race that way. You're either part of the race of Adam or you're part of the race of Christ. And that's it. There's no third option. Thomas Goodwin has a beautiful statement. There are but two men seen standing before God, Adam and Jesus Christ. And these two men have all other men hanging at their belts. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. You're either an old man or a new man. You're either unsaved or you're saved. If you've come to faith in Christ, that old person that you were in Adam is dead forever. Now you have a new identity in Christ. It's a decisive act in history. You're alive in him, dressed in his righteousness. But if you're not trusting in Christ, then you are still in Adam. And in Adam, all die. You cannot put sin to death because you are still dead in your sins. So everyone, please hear me. You are going to die. I don't know when, but someday you're going to die. And when you die, you will stand before Almighty God, before whom nothing is hidden. He sees everything. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Are you ready for that day? Are you in Christ? Have you been rescued from the wrath of God by faith in the Son of God? There can be no more significant question for you to resolve today than that. Please don't walk out of this place without having it resolved. If you're hearing his voice in your heart and you want to leave your sinful life behind and follow him, today is the day of salvation. Say in faith, I am resolved to go to the Savior leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one. He is the just one. He has the words of life. Let's pray together. Our dear God, we thank you so much for the gospel of Jesus, that you didn't leave us in a state of sin and misery, but that you sent Christ to be perfectly obedient, to lay down his life as a ransom for many, to purchase us from our wayward ways. And you create in him as the true human, the new man, the second Adam, your new people. And that by faith in him, nothing matters but the new creation. We pray that you would help us to live as members of your kingdom, thinking eternal thoughts, heavenly thoughts, things related to our true habitation of the new heavens and the new earth that is to come. We ask that you would help us by your spirit to put to death all these things that so easily overcome us. Thank you for the scriptures, for the way they shine a light into the dark places in our hearts. Would you work by them now in all of us? 
First to be real with ourselves and real with you, and then real with each other, that together we may fight the good fight of faith. This warfare was never meant to be pursued alone. Help us to fight together for the glory of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.